Laura, that second seat doesn't show on the camera, does it? I don't think so. Go for it. What if you're standing? standing. Stand up. You're good.
The calendars are still, the few that are left are out there. Um, if you would like a calendar and your name is on it, fine. If not, you don't need the calendar, please take your tag off so that we know that. Um, but Carl and Cindy will be returning from Honduras. Keep that in mind and their need of funding for their trip and for their mission work. Uh, keep that in mind. And also, we're proud to announce we have a quiz team this year. Uh, we're joining up with Conestoga and having a team together. So that'll be super special. Um, if you'd like to become a secret uh, supporter of that, uh, let Arnie and Esther know and we'll get you on that. Any other announcements that need to be made? Would you stand with us as we continue? <laughs>
This week, as I was thinking about this time in our service, uh, I looked up a couple of verses from the Bible and some commentary about praise, what praise is and what prayers, and I'd like to share those with you. The first one um, is found in Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then I looked up um, praise. Why do we praise God? First of all, for the Son, the gift of His Son and our salvation. But the Bible commands us to do it. And it says, as the psalmist says, let everything that breathes praise, let everything that breathes, I'm sorry, let me start over again, let everything that has breath praise the Lord, that's Psalm 150 verse 6, praise facilitates access to God, obviously it's the blood of Jesus that paves the way for our forgiveness from sin and relationship with God, Hebrews 10 19, that says, that's being said, our perpetual praise provides a clear and unhindering passage. Therefore, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Praise is where God lives. Wait a minute, isn't God's omnipotence everywhere, all the time? Absolutely. Yet his presence is especially intense in our atmosphere of praise. The Bible says God is enthroned upon the praises of Israel. That's Psalm 22, verse 3. And then last, praise chases away despair. There's no better way to beat the blues than to change or change our focus from self to God, since the shift produces the oil of gladness instead of mourning. That's Isaiah 61, verse 3. Okay, um, anyone have prayer requests or praises?
Western Penn Okay. Well, in about 13 hours, 4 minutes, and 7 seconds, uh, some of you are going to be saying, Happy New Year. And probably some of you will be saying nothing, just snoring. <laughs> but anyhow, as we think about the new year coming in, uh, this is not the main thrust of my sermon, but I thought I'd start off here with just uh, maybe give you a couple suggestions that a lot of people think of New Year's resolutions. And um, I read somewhere, I'm sure you can probably find different figures on this, that researchers say that only 9% of Americans that make resolutions complete them. And so uh, I think one of the reasons for that is uh, we make resolutions that's based on our strength and on what we can do, and we are weak in ourselves. But so, um, as I was thinking about, uh, we're going to talk about new sort of in the rest of the sermon, but about New Year and New Year's resolutions. I just have some suggestions that maybe if we make resolutions, some of us do and some don't, that uh, if you want to call them resolutions, you can, but that maybe the thing to focus on this year is not so much what we can do, but on, on who we can look at. So I'll just give you uh, four. The first one comes from Hebrews 2, and that's let's decide to fix our eyes on Jesus and take our eyes off of our failures and our abilities and put them on his success. And the second one is in 2 Corinthians 3.18. It's they're along the same line here. But that's where it says that, and all we who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. So let's decide to contemplate the Lord's glory. And then that's what it says, and then we're be, we will be transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And the third one is from Matthew 6, 33. Let's decide to um, seek first his kingdom and seek his righteousness, not our own righteousness, not what we can do, but what he's done. And that will change us and change the way and the things that we do. And if that verse goes on, it says, and all these things will be given to you as well. And the fourth one, I don't think we have it on PowerPoint, but is this, let's do the same thing that Mary did. Jesus said uh, to Martha, talking about Mary, he said, but one thing, one thing is necessary, and Mary has made the right choice and it will not be taken away from her. That choice that Mary made, that one thing that uh, she, she did, was to sit at the feet of Jesus and to hear what he had to say, and then she could go out from there and do the things that she should do. So as, as we welcome in a new year, 2024, very possibly um, at times we'll talk about what we hope to see new in that new year. Some of us may hope to see a new car, a new job, a new house. Uh, but it, there'll be a lot of things. We'll talk, we'll, we're looking to a new year. Maybe somebody will be just something as simple as hoping to get a new agreement for their internet or cable to, to save a little money, a little lower rate. And But what if you did get that, if you got that new rate, if you signed a new agreement, <coughs> contract, whatever you want to call it, and then six months later you find out that your spouse didn't know that, that you had that new agreement and was still paying the price of the old. Well, what would have happened in the meantime, you would have, to a certain extent, depleted your resources. So, uh, this morning what I want to do is remind us or make us aware of some of the things that are ours in the new covenant. We're talking about new versus the old covenant. And the reason I want to do that, that is just because, like the person that I talked about with the internet bill, they deplete their resources by paying it under the old contract. Um, I think that sometimes as believers, or maybe, too, maybe not just sometimes, too often as believers... New Covenant believers, we begin to operate under an Old Covenant mentality, and it does the same thing. It depletes, it depletes us. It depletes our joy. It depletes our energy. It depletes our enthusiasm. It depletes our love for God. And the reason is because 
under the old covenant, it relies on our power, on our ability. It's a, it's a, a covenant of works <coughs> relying on man. But the new covenant relies on his. That's Jesus' energy. It relies on, on his power. It relies on his ability. It relies on the work that he's accomplished. And so there's a big difference. So I have, uh, I just want to remind us of some of the things that are new in the new covenant uh, this morning. I have a pretty good list here. won't take too much longer than two hours to get through them. But, uh, <laughs> no, just kidding. But um, some of them we know, maybe some of them we, we didn't. And for sure, this is not an exhaustive list. I mean, there's, there's many more. But let's just talk about what's new in the new covenant that we're part of if we're believers. And we've got to start with this one. And that is that there's new birth. That's the first step in the newness of the new covenant. In 1 Peter 1, 3, Peter said, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy... He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And, of course, I think all of us know what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3. He said, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And, and then again in 1 Peter, he says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring Word of God. And Jesus is the living Word of God. I, uh, last Sunday when the kids were given their program, uh, they one of them read the verse uh, from John 1, 3. And it, it, I was thinking you know, about this sermon to some extent then, but it, it reminded me of this. And that verse said, through him, that's through Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. So, uh, new birth, which is a new creation, it's of Jesus. He's the one that makes all things. And, and then that verse goes on, or the next verse, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. And as I looked at this, thought about new birth, what's new in the new covenant, there was three items that stood out to me that they're pretty much saying the same thing, but then with, with different words. So in the new covenant, we are part of we have new birth, and the next one is new life. In Acts 5.20, when the angel rescued the apostles from, from prison, uh, the angel said, Go stand in the temple courts and tell the people about this new life. And in 2 Corinthians, uh, again, chapter 3, uh, it says, he, that's God, has made us competent as ministers of the, a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter, which was the old covenant, kills. But the spirit gives life. So new life is part of this new covenant. And, and Romans 6, 4 says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. The old covenant was a, a covenant of death. It said the letter kills. But the, and, and one of the reasons is the old sacrifices remained dead, but in the new covenant, the sacrifice, what was sacrificed, Jesus, is, is alive. He rose. And so it's a covenant of life. And a result of that is, that the third thing that's pretty much saying the same thing is, that we become new creations. We have new birth, new life, we become new creations. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if you're a believer, the new creation will come. Is that what it says? No, it says the new creation has come. You are a new creation if you're a believer, if, you, if you've been born again. The old has gone, and the new is here. And in Galatians 6, 15, Paul told the Galatians, he said, Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, which was part of that old covenant, means anything. What counts, he said, what counts is the new creation. So focus should be on, on not what we were, but what we are, the new creation. 
I think I need to just take a pause uh, at this point here where we've talked about new birth, new life, and new creation, and, and, and just um, say this, that this is the starting point of being part of, of the new covenant. And uh, if you haven't received new birth, if you haven't said yes to Jesus, you haven't recognized your need of him, the rest of what I'm going to talk about, what's part of the new covenant, isn't available. To you. I don't know how else to say it. You have to be born again, like Jesus told Nicodemus. But the rest of these good things that I'm going to talk about are available, they're freely available, because God offers that new birth just for the receiving and the asking. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Or if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But going on from there, for those, those of us that do know him, that have received that new birth, let's talk about some other things that are part of that new covenant that, that we, we have received. The, the, the first one that I have is, as new covenant believers, you have received a new heart or a new nature. That, uh, it, uh, we said it's part of new birth. Ezekiel 26, 6, uh, the Lord said, I will give you a new heart. And put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart, from you, your heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh. And in Acts fifteen nine, Peter, when he was talking about the Gentile believers, he said he that he and he, he meant God. He did not discriminate between us, the Gentiles or Jews, and them, for he purified purified their hearts by faith. That's a new heart. They had purified hearts as they became uh, believers. And then also, along with that, uh, in 1 Corinthians 2.16, Paul tells us, who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So in some way, you have a new mind also as a believer. Now, there's a little bit of a uh, thing there. The Bible talks about that we need renewed minds, so we have to sort of put together that new mind and renewed mind, but but we can we can believe the word of God that in God's sight we have a new mind in Christ too. But we have new hearts as believers and and uh, new minds. I'd like to read you a quote uh, from a book by Mike Petzer called "How Great a Salvation" that sort of speaks to this the new the new heart. And it's a pretty long quote, so I'm going to put it up so you can follow and hopefully catch what he's saying, but it, um, he says, when we speak of a nature, or I think you could put heart in there, we are speaking of a leaning, a propensity, and inclination. When we receive Christ, we have a new leaning, a new propensity, a new inclination inside of us that we did not have before. This leaning or inclination we have received wants to act like God. It wants to live holy and pure like God himself is. God does what he does because of who he is. He wants us to do what we do because of what we are. Before, before we were saved, we possessed an inclination within us to do evil. Now that we have been saved, we have a new life, God's own, that has an inclination to live holy. God's life is inclined to live godly. This is the life that makes us act the way we act. Righteousness could never be based upon something as weak as a mere commandment. It had to be based upon a life that lives itself out through our bodies, a life that dominates our whole person and transforms our outside to look like its glorious inside. To the degree that this life is known, I think this is an important sentence here, to the degree that this life is known to be the possession of the believer, and it is yielded to, it will be fully expressed. This is not automatic. It is dependent upon the renewal of our thinking and our willingness to yield. When this is done, though, it is unstoppable. God has placed his own driving force for good within our hearts, something previous generations under the law of Moses never had. And as 
being born again and, and having that new heart, one of the things that happens, something else is, that's new, is we become part of a new kingdom, the kingdom of the sun. We, went, we moved from darkness to light. We're into light now. Because Colossians says, for he, that's Jesus or God, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. And it all happened because there was a new sacrifice, a different sacrifice than under the old covenant. In fact, Hebrews calls it a better sacrifice. In Hebrews 9.23, it says, It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. That's talking about the old temple worship and the things in the temple. And they needed to be um, uh, purified with the, the sacrifices of animals, the blood of bulls and goats and, and animals. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, and that was the sacrifice in the blood of Jesus. So the, the sacrifice in the new covenant is a greater, a, a, a better uh, sacrifice, and one of the reasons is it's because it's an eternal sacrifice. Hebrews 10, 11, and 12 points out the, how the old uh, covenant sacrifices functioned. It says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest, and that means Jesus, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. He sat down because his work was finished. He didn't need to offer sacrifices over and over and over because his one sacrifice completed it all. And that sacrifice was completed. The other thing that is new in this new covenant is we have a new high priest, if you want to say new high priest. In Hebrews 7, 8, it says, For the law, the old covenant, appoints as high priests men in all their weakness. But the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. So the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant is, in the old covenant you had priests that were weak. And I've uh, got another verse here um, that would point point that out, but in the New Covenant we have a perfect high priest, Jesus. Hebrews 7.26, such a high priest, talking about Jesus, truly meets our needs. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. The Old Covenant, the priests, they were not holy, completely. They were not blameless. They were not completely pure. They were sinners, and they weren't exalted above the heavens. But the high priest that we have is all of those. And, and that's why we can have the, these new, new goodies, if I want to call it, that are part of the new covenant. In Hebrews 7, verse 27 there, it says, Unlike the other high priests, this is Jesus, he did not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. And, and it, it, going on in verse 25, Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Because we have this high priest, he, Jesus today is seated at the right hand of God because his work is finished, but yet... It, if you want to call it his work, he's seated there interceding for us. The next thing that I say we have that's new in the new covenant is a new consciousness. Under the old covenant, Hebrews 10.2 says this, The old covenant or the law can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year Make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered. Since the worshippers, once, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. Under the old covenant, the priest offered every day again and again the, 
the same sacrifices. And then once a year, the high priest went into the Holy of Holies. And then right away again, they would be offering more sacrifices. The sacrifices only reminded of sins. They did, there was an aspect where it covered sins, but it didn't take away sin because that verse says that if it did, the worshipers would no longer have been conscious of sins. But in contrast to that, this is the glorious thing about the new covenant. In contrast to that, the new covenant reminds us of forgiveness. In Matthew 26, 28, it says, for Jesus said, for this is the blood, is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. In Acts 13, 38, uh, the, the speaker said, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, Jesus, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. And indeed, in Hebrews, it tells us that the main clause or the final clause of the new covenant is uh, in Hebrews 10, 17, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. The new covenant is so strong, the blood of Jesus is so strong that it can cause God to forget, if you want to say it that way. The next thing that I want us to think about in this new covenant is that there's a new power in the new covenant. A new power, at, and it's at work in us. The old covenant of law, it had no power to save. It, had, it, it, it didn't have power to save. It only had the power to condemn and to kill. But the new covenant, so it was a covenant of death. And indeed, 2 Corinthians 3 says that it was a ministry of condemnation and death. But the new covenant in Jesus' blood, it has the power to free, it has the power to save, it has the power to create, it has the power to give life. And we're part of that new covenant if we're believers, and, and it's good for us to know that. The old covenant, in that sense, was against us. Colossians says it, it, it was against us and stood opposed to us. But the new covenant is for us. It's a power at work in us, lifting us up, transforming us from that life that's inside coming out. If we know, know it, as that one quote I read, if we know it and yield to it. And this was one, you know, sometimes when you study something sort of jumps out at me a little or stands out to me. As I, as I, when I went to Bible Gateway and I typed in power just to see, you know, well, of course you're going to get a long list because you have power that isn't just applying to the new covenant, you know, like he had power in, his, in whatever. Uh, but when I picked out the verses from the new, new Testament and the new covenant on power, I was really surprised at how many were there. This gospel, that this covenant that we are part of, is a powerful gospel. It's the dynamite of God. In fact, Paul says that, you know, he's not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation. But, so, I have a pretty long list with this one of verses, but I I, I thought about cutting it down, but it, it, it's because of the how many times it says it that it stood out to me. So I'm going to go through them. I'm trying to go through them pretty quick, but I it just want you to catch this is a powerful gospel that we're part of, and we need to recognize that and operate in that power. So first one is 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. 2 Corinthians but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power, all-surpassing power from God is from God and not from us. But it's an all-surpassing power that is in us. It's in jars of clay. But it, it, because it's in jars of clay, us and our weakness, it's clear then when, it, when we let it function that it's of God, that it isn't us. In 2 Corinthians, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Ephesians, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know his incomparably great power for us who believe. It's available to us who believe. It's not really available to you if you don't believe, if you're not born again. But it can be if you become born again. Ephesians 3.16 
I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Ephesians 3, 17 and 18. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's people. And look, look what he wants to give us the power to do. To grasp how wide and long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ. Ephesians 3, 20, a real... Uh, familiar verse. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power and look where that power is. It's at work in us. In Colossians being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. And finally in 2 Timothy for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid but gives us power Love and self-discipline. You get the idea that this gospel is a powerful gospel. And, and it's Christ in us. And if we'll let it work, we should see powerful things happening. The next thing I want to talk about is as part of the new covenant, you have a new qualification. Romans 3.19 talks about the qualification that the old covenant gave you. It says, now we know that whatever the law, the law is the old covenant, says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world held accountable to God. The old covenant disqualified you. It silenced you. It said, no, you don't have righteousness. No, you aren't able to come to God. Man keeps trying to, to twist the law and, and, and your flesh wants to twist it and make it and use it so that you say, yeah, I, I do have righteousness. But if you put the law in its pristine uh, perfect, perfectness, it condemns you because that's all it can do because you're weak in yourself. So you were disqualified under the old covenant. But in Colossians, he tells us, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his pe holy people or the saints in the kingdom of light. Under the new covenant, you're qualified by the blood of Jesus. He qualified us to, to be born again, to be, come into the presence of God. And that, that gives us a new, new confidence is the next one. It's a new confidence to enter the holy of holies or enter into God's presence. Under the old covenant... The, the high priest, uh, the priests entered the holy place, and the high priest once a year entered the holy of holies, which was where God's presence uh, dwelt. And basically, they, we think they entered with a certain amount of trepidation, hoping that they had followed the proper procedures, that they had done the right things. It was based in a sense, on, on them doing it doing it right. And there was the fear of if they did, that they could be struck down. But in the new covenant, we enter God's president presence confidently because we know that the proper procedures, if you want to term it that way, have been fully met by Jesus. The access to God, what's required to come into the presence of God, was fully met in our Savior, Jesus, our substitute. And so Ephesians 3.12 tells us, In Him, and through faith in Him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Or Hebrews 4.16, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. No, we don't... Uh, so, so how, you know, we need to ask ourselves that question, how am I approaching God? Not flippantly, but, but not, for sure, not fearfully under the new covenant. If we find ourselves approaching God fearfully or not confidently, we may be developing an old covenant mindset. Along with that, as part of the new covenant, we also have a new security uh, a security of God's presence that I will never leave you nor forsake you. You see, David, 
under the old covenant, even though David, David was under the old covenant, although he was a man with sort of a new covenant mental, mentality of, of mercy, of God's mercy, but he was under the old covenant. And under the old covenant, he said, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. But under the new covenant in Corinthians, it says that God has set his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Or then in John 14, 16, Jesus said, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another counselor. Now the spirit comes, as the other verse talked about, and lives in us as a guarantee of, of what is to come. And Jesus said, I'll give you another counselor to be with you forever. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The new security in the new covenant. And then also, we have a new hope in the new covenant. Under the old covenant, you sort of hope that you did it right, or that the priest did it right. Because it was based on imperfect men, and it was based on, on your works. But under the new, we believe that it's been done right, by a perfect man, and that he was our substitute, and that as, as we rely on him, put our faith in him, the new covenant is a covenant of faith in what Jesus did. And so, um, Hebrews 7 calls it a better hope. It says, the former regulation is set aside, which was the law, uh, because the old covenant the former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect. And a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. In Colossians, Paul told the Colossians, he said, uh, to continue in your faith, established and firm, and not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. And then a little bit later, he says what that hope is. He says, to them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery... The glorious riches of the mystery is this. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. That's the hope that we hold to. That Christ in us. And Peter says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth, which we talked about, into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The old covenant... The hope, in a sense, was in a, in a dead hope. The sacrifices remained dead. But in this new covenant, the, the sacrifice is living. It's a living hope. Jesus is at the right hand of God interceding for us. And so that, that's, you know, what an a, amazing benefit of the new covenant. And finally, or next to finally, there's another hope that the a new hope that... Uh, I, I would say is in the New Covenant that it talks about. It's called a blessed hope. You know what it is, Joe? Jesus is returning. Jesus is returning. Titus 2.13. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the hope of the New Covenant. Or, and then beyond that, in 2 Peter 3.13, he talks about, but in keeping with his promise... We are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So as we go into 2024, let's keep those things in mind. That we are part of a new covenant with all these benefits. And let's have a mindset to, to function under the new covenant. To recognize who we are because of what Christ has done. And, that, and, and to look forward to that blessed hope that Jesus is coming. The, 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 the look of the Christian is not that the Christian looks, looks for death, but we look for Jesus returning. And we look for a new heaven and a new earth when he, when he returns. So, um, let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your love that you were willing to send your son. You saw that we, uh, we couldn't hold up our end of the old covenant. 
And so you sent your son to do it for us. Lord, we thank you that we're the beneficiaries of that. I pray that in this year, in 2024, that you would just reveal to us from your word uh, all that we have and are in Jesus Christ, all that he is and that he dwells in us. And we thank you for that. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Oh.
down for a moment. Right, this morning. We're going to invite you all to our fellowship dinner. It's the last one of the last year, in any way. Um, but it's a special one for this year. We want to honor Arnie and Esther for the work that they've done with youth for so many years. Um, they have served the Lord in that capacity for years and years and years. And so we want to honor them today in a couple ways of doing that. But one will be, we're going to have them come up here in a minute, and we'll have a prayer um, just honoring them before the Lord. But also to set them on a new course. It's not like they're stepping aside. I know Arnie and Esther well enough to know that Arnie will be preaching and teaching just like he's always been, and Esther will be taking care of our church secretarial needs and whatever I need to do to get through the day, she'll be there. So that's the good part. But um, as far as the youth group, they're going to step down and we um, are welcoming new leaders in that area. So Arnie and Esther, would you come up here for just a moment? Won't, won't keep you too long. Um, come on over here. We have a gift for them, but it's a pretty scriptural gift that we're going to give them. It's just a card. But um, the scripture says we walk by faith, not by sight. Right. And at the end, the angel Gabriel is going to bring the trumpet, and the trumpet will sound. Okay. <laughs> That's your gift. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for Arnie and Esther, and just thank you for Arnie's message this morning. Father, what a blessing to our soul to know the newness of life in you. Thank you for that. Father, we ask also your blessing on Esther and Arnie as they chart a new course in their ministry with you. And Father, we pray that you would give them great insight. Thank you, Father, for the many lives they have touched in the youth departments and over different years in different churches. We just thank you for that. Father, we also ask now your blessing on the meal. Thank you for those that have prepared it and for those that have set the tables up and got everything all ready. We just thank you for that. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I can't go eat until these two go through the line first. <laughs> so, head out the door there. All right? You were also following uh, eating. Don't run away because we have a video we're going to show in here. So, after you're finished eating, we'll just come back into here and we'll have a little video to show you kind of in on.